in 1944. And if you do know the uh, geography of power in the world, 15th and Pennsylvania Avenue in Washington is the Treasury. 16th and Pennsylvania Avenue is the White House. 17th and Pennsylvania is the Executive Office Building of the President. 18th and Pennsylvania is the World Bank. And 19th and Pennsylvania is the IMF. So that's how this was created. I believe because the IMF has, I love the place, by the way. I've been spending my whole life trying to help them put the finance minister on this side and work together with them. And I've trained a large number of the staff. And I tell them often, that's not what you learned in class. So I'm trying to help them do the right thing. But that's a power situation also, obviously. So to answer your question, first of all, there is no definitive answer to this. Second, so how big approximately? Uh, somewhere between three and five trillion dollars a year. Okay, now is that a lot or a little? The world output is a hundred trillion dollars a year. The world saving is 30 trillion dollars a year. So we're talking about 3 to 5% of world GDP. And we're talking about uh, maybe, uh, so, uh, sorry, 10% uh, to 16.6% uh, to of global saving. Perfectly manageable. And saving isn't fixed, it could rise and so forth. So the gaps are not huge. They are quite manageable, given that these are our major global goals. And certainly the gaps for the poorest countries are not at all big. Maybe, maybe a trillion dollars a year. And a trillion dollars a year is 1% of world output. And if, if you gave me a trillion dollars a year, I would be able to help every government get out of poverty. That would be enough to make investments, get all the kids in school, get health care for every person, get water and uh, electricity connection for every person. That'd be a great start. And you could do that for a trillion dollars a year for all the billion people in extreme poverty. So it's not huge. So then comes lots of detailed, interesting, analytical questions. First, some of it is for rich countries, but the gap there isn't really a financing gap. It's a political choice gap. They're just not making investments, but the finance is available. Where the gap is really most consequential is for countries that cannot mobilize this out of their domestic resources. A poor country cannot afford to get all its kids in school, by the way. This is very weird because you think, well, at least you can do that. But I've spent 10 years on this calculation. And if you're a low-income country, it costs between 10 and 15% of GDP for universal primary and secondary education. Very high. The reason is teachers are relatively costly in low-income countries, and there are a lot of young kids in low-income countries because they have high fertility rates, so the whole age pyramid is very wide. So there's not an African country, low-income or lower-middle-income country, that can actually afford SDG4. And that should be the most alarming fact in the world because you cannot have economic development without your kids educated. No matter what else you do, you cannot have economic development without educated kids. So it's for the low and lower middle income countries that the crisis is biggest. There are gaps in the high income countries, but I don't worry too much about them because those are political obstacles that should be filled, but it's manageable. 
upper middle income is tricky because some upper middle income countries have good access to credit, others don't have access to credit. Then there's another consideration. Sorry, and I'll draw. I'll come come to a, a conclusion. Technically, what do you do? There are two uh, related issues. One, how could you make capital flow at relatively low cost and long term maturity to poorer countries? This is the major technical question on finance. If you look at the penalties that low income countries pay to borrow, they're quite steep. You pay 10 or 15 percent interest rates. If you are a double B borrower sub investment grade compared to what a triple A or double A minus borrower pays. And why is that? <laughs> Long story, and I won't go into it, but making that flatter so that for poor countries they have access to low cost capital is crucial. One way to do that is larger multilateral development banks. This is everybody agrees on that, though they don't agree to do it, but they agree that that's one part of the solution. More ADB, more AIIB, more new development bank, more World Bank, that requires capital increases. Capital increases mean larger voting shares for China. The United States needs to swallow and Europe needs to swallow and get on with it. So that's one part of what needs to be done. The second part is to de-risk private capital flows. That's also a tricky set of issues. I'd say I got into that question 45 years ago as a graduate student, and it's still somewhat of a puzzle. It's a long story, but it's not impossible to do that. There's one more dimension, and because also you're from the Russian Federation, I want to mention it. And that is that there is an intrinsic link between global finance and global monetary arrangements. And global monetary arrangements mean how we settle trade. And we are, of course, in a largely dollar based settlements system. So the monetary system is largely dollar based, not exclusively, but about 60 percent. And the United States unfortunately and unwisely weaponized the dollar based payment system starting about 15 years ago by seizing assets, including Russian assets recently, the $300 billion seized in 2022, but also Iran, North Korea, uh, Afghanistan, Venezuela, and a number of others. To my mind, this is a completely unacceptable and self-defeating policy. It's cheap because the president of the United States can do it with a stroke of the pen. You don't have to ask Congress. You don't have to ask the public. You don't have to ask the UN. You don't have to ask anybody. To my mind, it's blatantly illegal and absolutely practically unwise. Because why would you use dollars if the US is going to take them away from you when they don't like what you're doing? The idea of payments is that they're reliable, not that they're political. So this is why the BRICS countries, especially under Russia's leadership this year, are negotiating non-dollar payments. And I support this entirely. And, but I also say to the US Treasury all the time, don't confiscate other people's money. It's not a good policy. It's not going to work. And the idea, by the way, of grabbing Russia's 300 billion for Ukraine is so illegal, you don't even know where to start. But these are politicians. They're not lawyers. They're not diplomats. They're not financiers. They want quick solutions for their reelections. So this is really a problem. But it's a problem that also has a solution because we just won't use the dollar in places where the United States policies could lead to confiscation. 
So all of this means we have a bit of a morass in the international financial system within our family of getting the right answers to the financing questions. There's actually one more technical point I need to mention, uh, which is that um, the IMF and the World Bank have what they call the Debt Sustainability Framework, or DSF. And it's based on an arbitrary set of numbers where they say, we grade you whether you're weak medium or strong in debt management and then based on your ranking we give you a ceiling of gross debt to gdp and the ceiling is no more than 30 percent debt to gdp ratio if you are a weakly governed country this is a death certificate this is not economic policy why? Because if you're a poor country, it means almost by definition you don't have electricity, you don't have paved roads, you don't have digital access, and your kids aren't in school. So what the IMF and the World Bank are telling you is stay that way. Don't bother us. Don't borrow because you might get into debt trouble. But if you don't borrow, you won't have electricity, schools, or anything else. They don't have an alternative solution for these countries. So they're telling the countries, don't borrow. I'm telling the countries, borrow. But my advice is borrow 30-year maturity, fixed interest rates, and on reasonable terms. Ah, but where do you get those? That's where I want the G20 to come into this story, to give an answer to that. But when I do, again, in my spare time, solving a growth model for how much you should borrow if you want to have your kids in school, have electricity and so on, exactly your question, the debt actually rises to about 200% of GDP before it starts declining 30 years from now. You want to borrow a lot because you don't want to live without electricity, you don't want to live without roads, you don't want to live without educated children, you don't want to live without health facilities. So you want to borrow, but you want the borrowing to be very long term so that you have 40 years to grow in order to repay the debt 40 years from now. The IMF has none of this intertemporal analysis because the debt sustainability framework is a five year snapshot it's not a growth scenario now i taught intertemporal growth for 30 years and i this is where i tell my students you learn something right you borrow if the rate of return on your investment is higher than the cost of capital and if you're not going to get into a debt crisis in the meantime so we need to create a finance framework that can work final words for this region, SCAP, there are a few countries that are seriously debt constrained or finance constrained. Most are not, but some are. For Africa, it's pervasive. The whole continent is debt constrained right now. So that's where the most serious problems are. Within this region, you have the means to solve the problem because this is a high saving region. And China has a saving surplus. That's why initiatives like the Belt and Road Initiative are wonderful. And they should really be encouraged. But the advice I give to China is when you lend for the Belt and Road Initiative, lend for 30 years. Don't lend for 10 years or 12 years. You will be disappointed and your counterpart will be very disappointed because they'll get into debt crisis. And that's what's happening right now. Not that China set a debt trap, that's propaganda. China didn't set a debt trap, it just set a maturity structure too short. And so when I speak to the Chinese finance authorities, I'm telling them 30-year loans. And nobody thinks ahead more than China. 
So China needs to do the same thing of looking at a 30-year perspective and especially for the poor countries, give much longer term loans. And for the rest of the US, unfortunately, is not a net savings surplus country. It's a net debtor country. So it can't offer much in finance anymore. But the capital markets could offer more. And we need to tap that. Sorry for the long winded answer, but a good, uh, very good question, important question and allies on China's periphery and strengthen U.S. military forces along the Asian rimland despite any Chinese opposition. This has become the Biden foreign policy. China knows it. China really is pushing back. But what's very important and interesting to understand, and we've seen it clearly in the dynamics involving the Ukraine war, most of the world also does not want the U.S. as the as the, the global preeminent power. Most of the world wants a multipolar world and do, is therefore not lined up behind the United States sanctions on Russia and so forth. And this was also the message of President Lula visiting China, saying to President Xi Jinping, we as Brazil also want multipolarity, true multipolarity, and we want peace, for example, in the Russian-Ukraine war that is based on not a U.S. perception of dominant, say, NATO enlargement, but rather a peace that reflects a multipolar world. This is real. It's happening all over the world. And the, the fact of the matter is, the reason why this is a historic watershed is that the underlying economics and tech, technological change have made it so. The, the U.S. is no longer the dominant world economy. And the G7, which is the U.S., Canada, Britain, France, Italy, Germany, and Japan, is actually smaller than the BRICS countries in economic size, which is Brazil, Russia, India, China, and South Africa. So we really are, in fact, in a multipolar world, but in ideology, we're, we're in a conflict. Uh, but Jeffrey Sachs, I wanted to ask about that. Uh, you mentioned the BRICS. Uh, uh, the, the, uh, the, the BRICS bank that is now in China, uh, and uh, President Lula has named Dilma Rousseff as the as the head of the BRICS bank. It, it's important in terms of this multi uh, multipolarity of uh, in the world economies. The the and the potential for even the creation of alternative uh, major currencies to the dollar uh, as a result of the BRICS alliance. The impact of that uh, on uh, world affairs. This is a big deal. And in fact, the United States uh, is withdrawing. It doesn't know it necessarily. Our politicians don't understand this. But our politicians are withdrawing from the world financial and monetary scene and opening up the space for a completely different kind of international finance. I'll give you an example. The, the U.S. was the creator of the World Bank. But now the U.S. Congress won't put new money into the World Bank. Uh, and because of that, the World Bank's actually a quite small institution. It's got a big name, but it's a quite small institution in the financial scheme of things. The U.S. won't put more money in. The Congress says, no, why should we waste our money uh, internationally and so forth? And you get a lot of uh, hubbub about that. So China and the rest of the BRICS say, OK, we'll make our own development bank. And they established the new development bank, or sometimes called the BRICS Bank, based in Shanghai. And that's just one of the institutions that is really changing the scene. There's the Asia Infrastructure Investment Bank, AIIB, based in Beijing, uh, in fact. Uh, there is, uh, as President Lula uh, said, and it's happening also in the context of the Ukraine war, a move away from the use of the dollar, which the United States has thought, well, that's 
that's our ace in the hole. You know, that is our ultimate hold on things because we can use sanctions. We can use our financial control to keep other countries in line. But other countries are saying, eh, not so much. We'll trade in renminbi. We'll trade in rubles. We'll trade in rupees. We'll, we'll trade in our own national currencies. And they're quickly setting up alternative institutions to do this. The United States doubles down. We will confiscate your reserves. We will, uh, if you don't follow. And the other countries are saying, you know, if you want to go through the UN and get really multilateral well, rules, we'll, we're with no. you. But, but if you want uh, to just impose the rules, we won't follow along. And so we have this very funny expression called a rule-based international order. The United States government uses it every day. But what does it mean? Who writes the rules? And what most of the world wants, in fact, is rules written in a multipolar or multilateral setting, not rules written by the United States and a few friends and allies. I wanted to ask you, uh, you've been an advisor to uh, to the United Nations for uh, quite often. The issue of how much longer the permanent members of the Security Council can keep the number to five, because clearly Brazil and other countries of the global south have been saying the U.N. needs to be reformed. Uh, and countries from Latin America, specifically Brazil and Africa, should have representation on the U.N. Security Council permanent members. Yes, uh, you know, the P5, the permanent five, which is the United States, China, Russia, France, and the United Kingdom, was the World War II victor group in 1945. They wrote into the rules of the UN, incidentally, that they would be the permanent Security Council members and have a veto over any change in the UN charter. So it's it's really a group that uh, gave itself uh, power that uh, the other 188 countries uh, of the world look on and say, what is this? We need change. I, I would say the country that is most uh, uh, amazed and frustrated by this, uh, in fact, is India. India is now the most populous country in the world. Uh, the United States has 330 five million roughly uh, in the population, uh, Britain, France, uh, roughly 60 million, India, 1.4 billion, not on the Security Council, a nuclear power, a, a world superpower, the president of the G20 this year, really not happy about that. Uh, Brazil, uh, the large largest economy of South America, similarly uh, not on the Security Council. So this has been an issue for more than 20 years. The P5 in various ways have blocked uh, uh, particular countries, but added up the P5 have said, you know what, this is our club. <laughs> we want to stay as the permanent five. But I think as we really face the reality of a, it's not just a post-U.S dominated world, but actually a post-Western dominated world, because it was the U.S. as the dominant power among the so-called West, which means the U.S., Britain, European Union, uh, and honorary Western membership, Japan, let's say. But we're post-Western as well as post-U.S. in dominance. And these international institutions will need to change or they won't function in the 21st century. And if they don't function, it's actually a disaster for us. If they didn't exist, we'd have to make them because we need them to function. So we also need to renovate them. I wanted to talk about uh, China um, negotiating these various agreements. Um, Let's turn to Brazil's President Luiz Inácio Lula da Silva, speaking before his meeting with Chinese President Xi Jinping. 
What does Putin want? Putin can't keep Ukraine's territory. Maybe we don't even discuss Crimea, but he will have to rethink what he has invaded. Also, Zelensky can't have everything he wants to demand. NATO will not be able to set itself up at the border, so this is something we have to put on the table. I think this war has dragged on for too long. Brazil has already criticized what it had to criticize. Brazil defends each nation's territorial integrity, so we disagree with Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Because it looks like um, Ukraine is on the verge of a major counteroffensive against Russia. And in order to do this, needs massive support from Western countries, meaning uh, military weapons. Uh, can you talk about um, what China's role is here, the peace plan it has put forward, but also these other deals that China is helping to negotiate, like the, success, uh, the successful rapprochement between Saudi Arabia and Iran, and then what they're, uh, uh, what they're suggesting about Israel and Palestine? President Lula uttered, uh, in a few words, the core of this issue that our most of our media dare not explain to the American people, and that is the expansion of NATO. This is a war fundamentally about the U.S. attempt to expand a U.S. military alliance to Ukraine and to Georgia. Georgia is a country in the Caucasus, also on the Black Sea. The U.S. strategy, going back decades, has been to surround Russia in the Black Sea, with Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, and Georgia, all NATO members surrounding Russia and its naval fleet in the Black Sea, with a naval fleet that has been the Black Sea naval fleet of Russia since 1783. Russia has said, this is our red line. And it has said that for decades. And it said this clearly in 2007, before George W. Bush Jr. had the, I'll call it the harebrained idea to announce in 2008 and force NATO to announce that Ukraine will be a member of NATO. And this is what President Lula was saying and what, Pres what uh, President Xi Jinping of China has been saying. We can't have a war that is essentially a proxy war between Russia and the United States over the expansion of the U.S. military alliance right up to a 1,200-kilometer and more border with Russia, which Russia views, and I would say understandably views, as a fundamental national security threat to Russia. Keep some space. Keep some distance. That's President Lula's meaning. That's what China means when it says in its peace plan, we want a peace plan that respects the security interests of all parties. What that is is code word for saying, make peace, end the war, but don't expand NATO right up to the border. The American people have not heard an explanation of this all along. It's shocking to me because as a close observer of this for 30 years, this has been the casus belli. And yet our newspapers won't even report the background to this. But this is why China, South Africa, India, Brazil are saying we want peace, but we don't want NATO expansion as the meaning of so-called peace. We want the big superpowers to give each other some space and some distance so that the world isn't on a knife edge. That's exactly what President Lula was saying, and it's exactly what the meaning of the Chinese peace initiative is, is to say, yes, absolutely make peace, protect Ukraine's sovereignty and its security, but no to NATO expansion. But the Biden administration won't even discuss this issue. That has been the major failing and the reason why we have not been able to get to the negotiating table, in my opinion, even when Zelensky said in March 2022, maybe not NATO, maybe something else, Russia and Ukraine were close to an agreement, and the United States intervened with Ukraine and said, mm, we don't think that's a good agreement, because the U.S. 
neocons, so-called, have been pushing for NATO enlargement as the core of this issue. But this goes back to the more general point for us, which is that what is at stake in Ukraine and over Taiwan and many other issues from the point of view of China or Russia or other countries, including Brazil, now Saudi Arabia, Iran and others, is whether the U.S. does what it wants to do or whether the U.S. respects some limits based on what other countries say, well, this is what we think, so that we need true multipolarity, not U.S. dominance alone. Rules written by all of us, not rules written just by the United States. And Jeff Sachs, we only have a, a, a few, uh, about a minute left, but I was wondering if you could comment on the uh, the parallels uh, between this uh, expansion of NATO further and further uh, east in, uh, in Europe. Uh, t this year marks the 200th anniversary of the Monroe Doctrine, of President Monroe declaring to all the European powers that the Western Hemisphere was off limits uh, to them coming to attempting to move their forces and their militaries into Latin America. And for these past 200 years, Latin America has essentially been uh, the major sphere of influence of the United States. Uh, and yet here we are saying that Russia has uh, no right to declare that its immediate, uh, the countries in uh, immediately its borders uh, cannot uh, cannot uh, welcome in uh, NATO troops. Well, <laughs> yes, a little empathy would go a long way and would have spared us actually a lot of wars. But for Americans, it would be useful to think, suppose Mexico made a military alliance with China. Would the United States say, well, that's Mexico's right. What are we going to do about it? Or might there be uh, actually an invasion uh, in short order or something like that? I would strongly advise to China and Mexico, don't try it at home. Don't experiment with this. But the United States government refuses that empathy because, in other words, refuses to put itself in the position of the other side. That's the fundamental arrogance of thinking that you determine the rules of the world. The problem with arrogance is not only uh, the comeuppance from it, but you can't, you stumble into terrible crises that you don't even understand because the United States has not been allowed, the public has not been allowed to even think from the perspective of the other side. So the analogy is, is actually a very, very clear analogy. It is what China and Russia and others say all the time is, why have those double standards? Why don't we actually deal with each other with mutual respect, not with the rules that you write? That China must really have cheated at every moment. And they really must be our enemy also. This is extremely dangerous. It's either us or them at the top of the world. And only a US-led world is a safe world. Otherwise, we're all going to be destroyed by China. It is, in my view, a fantasy misunderstanding. I'll start again with the basic proposition. China's living standards are about a third of the US. China has decades of economic development to make. China faces major challenges. Population is now starting to decline quite significantly. China will probably be under 1 billion people by the end of this century, possibly 800 million, according to the UN forecasts, which are mechanical, but still showing how significant. China will age very rapidly. There are many, many challenges. China's not out to take over the world. But the US whole vision is US is the world leader. It's the self-image. It's what I'm afraid is taught at the Kennedy School of Government often. My question would be the following one. If we assume that this conflict is going to end in a way that's not going to be a defeat, an explicit defeat of Russia, do you see that having any consequences of the future role of dollar as an international currency? And what do you think is going to happen on the US Treasury bond market in the future? Thank you. 
Just a, in a general word about uh, the role of the U.S. dollar. It has been a source of a lot of U.S. power and prerogative. The fact that about 60 percent of world trade is denominated in dollars and settled in dollars. And the U.S. banking system is the predominant mechanism for clearing transactions. And the SWIFT system, which is how the U.S. banking system settles transactions, is uh, the instrument by which the U.S. excludes Russia, for example, under the sanctions. I believe that in 10 years from now, the role of the dollar will be much, much less than it is today. Uh, and in 20 years, we'll have a, a very different international monetary system. And the U.S. will have lost uh, what was called by uh, de Gaulle an exorbitant privilege, but it will have lost the privilege of having the key currency in the world. I think there are three reasons for this decline that will come that's already underway. One is that to be the world currency depends on being the predominant economy in the world. <clears throat> and as the U.S. share of the world economy diminishes, it's natural that the role of the U.S. dollar would diminish as well. And we are, as I said, on a gradual, gentle decline, not gentle, but gradual decline of the share of world output due to the U.S., not mainly because of the U.S. collapse, but mainly because the rest of the world develops economically, like China. So that's one reason. The second reason is much more pertinent to this uh, evening, and that is the U.S. began to weaponize the dollar roughly a decade ago. So it basically began to use the dollar as a geopolitical instrument. And my advice is if you are a government that isn't getting along too well with the U.S., hold your reserves in some other currency. Because the U.S. has developed a bad habit of seizing foreign exchange reserves of governments that it doesn't like. And it has done that with Venezuela, with Iran, with Afghanistan, with North Korea, and now with Russia. It views that as a, an easy thing to do. Stroke of a pen by the president, and your antagonist, your foe, can't use their dollars anymore. We even did that with Afghanistan on the way out. Seized all, froze all the foreign exchange reserves so that the economy completely collapsed in that impoverished place afterwards. It's nasty, by the way. But more than being nasty, it also is not something you can do over and over again because other countries start to say, maybe we'll hold our reserves in renminbi, thank you, or maybe we'll hold them in some other currency, thank you. And that's what's happening now. So that's a second reason for why the dollar will decline, because it's not just a money, it's an instrument of geopolitics, which it should not be. You can have one or the other, but you can't have the geopolitical instrument for very long. You won't have the key currency anymore. And the third is technological. I think that transactions will not be settled through commercial banks in the future in anything like the way they are now, because we will have digital central bank currencies. And we don't need the commercial banks in the long term to settle our transactions. Probably the digital renminbi will be a first digital currency, probably for use within China. But then it will start to be expanded internationally. Several other central banks will make digital currencies. This is quite different from crypto. Crypto is you have an electronic account that's nonsense, and you think it's going to hold value. It's every day I wake up, sorry to say, if you're Bitcoin lovers, every day that Bitcoin has any value at all, I think the world's still crazy. So uh, Bitcoin has no intrinsic value, 
and it's not a legal reserve currency for anything, and it's not a legal means of payment, and it's not a national fiat currency which can at least settle your debts uh, internally. It's unbelievable that people spend money for this electronic cipher and this arrest of this kid in the United States should tell you this is a little crazy. But what I'm talking about is something else, which is a central bank currency, because there a digital central bank currency is just a means of clearing payments rather than writing checks like we used to do or even making electronic ledgers through Venmo we use in the United States and so forth, uh, whichever e-wallet system you use, the central bank can do that actually. And I think that we'll go to that kind of settlements. And so the U.S. ability to say, ah, we're going to cut you off from SWIFT, eh, so what? Uh, so I think in 10 years or 15 years from now, it'll be quite a different international monetary system. And uh, my question is, uh, what is your vision of uh, the role of Russia in the, the future in the conflict of uh, U.S. and China? Thank you very much. The role of, of Russia in the conflict between the U.S. and China. The role of Russia in the conflict. Yes. Look, uh, ba basically, um, ba basically, uh, much of the world, as I say, is going to have trade relations with China because <laughs> why not? It's, it's a good trading partner. And uh, China will be the world's main trading partner for a significant majority of the world. And Russia is among them and physically uh, being neighbors uh, so that Russia can make uh, gas and oil pipelines and provide uh, other raw materials which China doesn't have makes them very complementary economies. And since the US has designated both of them as enemies, it makes them natural allies. We, we did the one thing that Zbigniew Brzezinski said, never do. Uh, Zbigniew Brzezinski was uh, you know, the uh, geopolitical strategist who in 1997 said how important Ukraine was for this geopolitical competition. But in his book, The Global Chessboard, he says, well, this will be the geographical pivot of Eurasia. But the one thing the United States must never do is drive China and Russia together. Uh, and, and then he says, but this is very unlikely to happen. Uh, and so, you know, it's uh, the US, you shouldn't declare enemies this way. Uh, it, make, it doesn't even make sense on your own terms uh, of your own geopolitical competition. Uh, and that was, you know, that was Nixon's idea of triangulating between Russia and China, or Soviet Union and China, uh, during the Cold War period. But we did what we were told, oh, that will never happen because it's such a bad idea. So right now, that is a, a friendship without limits, as they say, because the U.S. is targeting both of them. And the U.S. is talking the European Union into more and more of an anti-China policy. And I just can't believe it that Europe would fall for this. Because Europe absolutely for its prosperity needs a good relationship with China. And for a long time in the future, China will be a neighbor of Europe in Eurasia. And so you're actually on the same landmass, too. And so having good relations would be a good thing, but not in the US mindset. And so the US has launched a chips war against China. You know, this is incredible, this chips war, just to, oh my god. I need an hour to say what I want to say, yeah, but I'll yeah. say it in I'll say it in uh, in one minute. There's one more question. The, the U.S. So has why. said we're going to try to stop the Chinese economy from, you know, modernizing at the front level by restricting the sale of advanced chips. Terrible idea, in my view. Completely belligerent. But yesterday. Apparently, according to the Financial Times, I don't know whether it's definitive or not, Netherlands said, we go along with this. 
if Europe just follows the U.S. on this, it's not going to defeat China, but it sure is going to boomerang against Europe. It makes no sense. And what Europe should be saying to the United States is, calm down. You're still powerful. We still like you. You don't have to, you know, you're still richer than China per capita. You can calm down. We don't want a war with China, too. And that's what Europe should really be saying to the United States for its own. Thank group. you, Jeff. But there's one more question. And uh, I, I, really, I really have to, to make a, an exception, because I, <laughs> I really don't know what would have happened if I don't allow this. But my wife actually wants to ask a question. It this is a catches perfect. me by surprise. So <laughs> Natasha Yeremich wants to ask a question. <laughs> Okay, an easy question. <laughs> Current situation on climate change is hot and getting hotter fast. And just to give you, uh, to, to give you a, a couple of uh, grim realities on this, the rate of warming of Earth on average has been 0.18 degrees Celsius per decade during the last 30 years. So that means that Earth has warmed by about half of one degree C over the past 30 years. Earth is now warming currently at about twice that rate, at about 0.36 degrees Celsius per decade. Now compared to the pre-industrial temperature, the Earth is 1.2 degrees warmer than it was before industrialization. If you take 0.36 degrees C per decade, that means we'll be 1.56 degrees Celsius warmer than pre-industrial 10 years from now. That means we will be above the limit set in the Paris Agreement within 10 years. And according to my favorite climatologist, Dr. James Hansen, who I've relied on for decades, and he's been right on everything he's told me for decades, he thinks that in, a, yeah, in the next few years, when we go from the La Nina cycle in the Pacific Ocean to an El Nino, which raises the Earth's temperature on what's called an interannual basis, we could have an excess beyond 1.5 degrees Celsius, the Paris limit, within the next five years, the next big El Nino. We're in a La Nina right now. All of this is to say, ladies and gentlemen, if you have any doubt at all about global warming, it's real, it's serious, it's accelerating, and it's going to create a terrible mess no matter what we do. But if we don't do what we need to do, it's going to create a catastrophic mess. Is absolutely destroying one Ukrainian army after another. This is obvious. And the much talked about uh, Ukrainian hyper uh, counteroffensive that was uh, supposed to take place in June 2023 and reach the Sea of Azov. Of course, it didn't reach anything. It didn't do anything other than kill tens of thousands of Ukrainians and cost an unbelievable amount of uh, money in destroyed tanks, weapon systems, uh, artillery, uh, everything. So it's been a disaster. These are the worst poker players I've ever seen. All they do with a lousy hand is keep raising the stakes and keep losing. Maybe now they are trying to, to shift focus, shift attention to, to Gaza or maybe to some other conflicts. Because actually when you are losing in one, then ah, you can try but, you to know, induce you, more chaos. You asked me a question, which I didn't answer. <laughs> I gave a long answer. If there but, is a way but, out. No, no, but you asked me a question, what to do? And, and the point I would make is the first thing we should do is stop raising the ante, you know? 
stop saying, oh, we're going to defeat them. It's easy. Uh, we're going we're gonna to beat them. No, Ukraine's not going to defeat Russia. And the more that this goes on, the more dead Ukrainians there are. That's just the most basic point. And the whole society has been so profoundly wounded because millions and millions of Ukrainians are in Europe or are in Russia and hundreds of thousands are dead because of this. So the population has collapsed and there aren't young people anymore. Now they want to draft kids and young women because they've run out of soldiers. It's terrible. And so we need to stop raising the ante. Now, what would that mean? We need to negotiate. We need to say first, okay, NATO is not enlarging. But Russia, you have to stop taking more and more Ukraine. And what the Russians are going to say at this point is, okay, we keep the following territories. And we're going to have to negotiate over that because the idea that, no, we don't make any concessions, you're just going to be defeated, is going to end up destroying all of Ukraine. It's, it's raising the stakes on a lousy hand. And we should recognize that we are going to need a political outcome right now, not the one we wanted, but we were so dumb not to take a better deal a year ago, two years ago, five years ago, 10 years ago, that now we're in a situation where we're not going to get exactly what we, quote, want. But to continue the fighting would absolutely destroy even more. What worries me most is actually that really the lives of Ukrainians are just taken as a, as a casualty, as something not even worth speaking about. They That's... don't even talk about it. The no. leadership no. is absolutely gross. You know, I look, I, I'm sure that uh, Zelensky is in a very hard place, but all he talks about right now is throwing more lives to the graves. Frankly, no strategy, no self-awareness, no situational awareness. Okay, it's very sad because the United States talked him out of a peace agreement in March 2022. That was Zelensky's chance, and he lost it. He was inexperienced. You know, when you the United States comes and tells you, we have your back, you you know, you tend to believe it if you're inexperienced. I tried to tell him, by the way, I, you know, I, I really tried to tell the Ukrainians, look, I'm, a, I'm an old guy. I've been through lots of U.S. wars, Vietnam War, Nicaragua, uh, the Gulf Wars, uh, Syria. They never win. Are you kidding? Do you really want to end up like Afghanistan? And they didn't believe me. They just thought, oh, you're a Putin apologist. Uh, so they didn't want to hear any of this. But I was telling them the hard facts about American wars, and they didn't want to hear it. Uh, besides Russia, I, I'm not sure that Ukraine actually is such a big topic uh, in uh, in American uh, policy. I'm not sure about that. Yeah, um, it's, it's maybe, maybe definitely the minute. You know, it's a big focus of the political class still, the military-industrial complex and the White House. Maybe for just political reasons that uh, Biden doesn't want to admit what a lousy poker player he is. But the, the point is, uh, for the American people, they've had enough. There's no groundswell of support. People don't want that. They want to stop this thing. And so in that sense, you're absolutely right. Typically, the public doesn't have much say in this. We have almost no public debate. But Biden's popularity is really collapsing. And if the uh, unhappiness with Biden's foreign policy is very, very clear. So maybe even public opinion is going to start playing a role because we're now in an election year. Um, I would like to ask you to clear the position on China, because when I look both at the Republicans or at the Democrats, I would say that their views on China are very similar. So they actually have very hostile views uh, towards China. Uh, now there was a summit 
uh, APEC, where uh, both presidents Biden and Xi Jinping met. Um, do you see any, any decline in tension, any hopes that actually the relations, they are probably not going to be friendly, but let's say at least stabilize and, and would be less, less threatening for the world? I'll tell you an interesting thing. When uh, President Xi came to this APEC summit in San Francisco, he met uh, 200 U.S. business leaders and they gave him a standing ovation. I don't think they would give an American president a standing ovation, but they gave President Xi a standing ovation. Why? China is their biggest market. They both produce in China. They sell in China. They make a lot of money in China and they want normal relations. What what is happening is two things. One, we have a kind of security class in America who uh, are all about uh, American dominance, American hegemony, America being number one. It's a very strange group of people, uh, but this is uh, our foreign policy establishment. Then we have politicians who basically... Uh, think that, and it's very particular, uh, Trump in 2016 won the election by winning swing states in the middle of America, in the American Midwest, which is our industrial zone. And he won it by saying, China took your jobs away. Mm. And when he made narrow victories in those states, the Democrats said, oh, we have to attack China in order to compete politically with Trump. So there are two reasons for the anti-China sentiment in the United States. One, and in the political class, one is this idea of America being the only dominant country. Yeah. Well, I mean, you know, you know, unless you're playing a board game like the game of risk, you don't get to be the dominant country in the world when there are other big countries around. So this is arrogance, again, very misguided. Then there is this protectionist politics, uh, which uh, tries to appeal to a few swing states in the U.S. elections. The upshot of this is that the political class, both Democrats and Republicans, are pretty united against China, pretty ignorant from my experience. They don't know China, oh. they don't know Chinese history, they don't have any perspective. They play a dangerous game, like when uh, our Speaker of the House, Nancy Pelosi, flew to Taiwan. Oh. So stupid, sorry. Just why do you want to provoke another thank superpower? You, thank you for saying that. Because no, we so have the same stupid. representatives who are also provoking China right. in this in this country. No. Uh, okay. Don't provoke China. Be respectful. Just have normal relations. Don't provoke a superpower. Why? What is in it to poke a superpower? It's stupid. People should think. You know, if there's some, even if you think there's a bully, which China's not, but if you think there's a bully in the schoolyard and you're a, you know, a little kid, and you think they're the bully, is it really smart to go poking them and say, you're a bully, I hate you? No, you're going to get hurt in the end. So you need some common sense. And China's not even bullying. China is just big, successful, dynamic, actually a good trade partner for Europe. So we should treat it normally, respectfully. And uh, the U.S., anxieties should not be Europe's anxieties. This is another area where European politicians are just repeating the words of American politicians. And you know, I know behind the scenes, it's although it's obvious, you know, why does van der Leyen repeat words almost like Biden? Because she feels that her job is to be with the United States. Maybe she hopes the United States appoints her as the Secretary General of NATO or something. I don't know oh, what it is. No, but that's what, what she hopes, maybe. So mm -hmm. this is where Europe makes a big mistake, just like it did make a big mistake in Ukraine, 
it would make a big mistake of trying to make an enemy out of China. That's a completely ridiculous losing proposition. Uh, my last question, because time, our time is coming up, I have to reflect one very current event you already mentioned, and that's uh, the elections in Argentina. Yes. Because let's say that uh, the elected president is an unusual personality. Um, how, how do you view this situation? Um, is there a danger for, for BRICS or, or maybe for other Latin American countries with his very strange suggestions as for foreign policy, as for economics? Yeah, of course, time will tell. One thing is uh, he won the presidency but has uh, no uh, control over the Congress. Uh, his small parties, and at least for the moment, doesn't have any kind of governing coalition in the Congress. So maybe his uh, ability to uh, do things will require a much broader coalition of forces, and that could be a, a constraint. But <laughs> let me just say first, Argentina is a country that has been unstable for its whole history, going back to the 1820s, ever since independence. Argentina has messed up more currencies, had more inflation and more instability than any other place on the entire planet. This guy won, not because of what he says, but because of disgust with the outgoing government, which was delivering inflation of triple digits, uh, more than 100%. You can't really win an election when inflation is a triple digit. And I know Argentina quite well uh, and actually worked with the finance minister just before this one. And he ended up, he was doing a good job and he ended up being not forced out. He resigned, unfortunately. Uh, but he resigned because his own, I would say, corrupt politicians in his own party were uh, rejecting the normal policies that he was trying to promote. So Argentina is now in yet another cycle of instability. Uh, all my professional career as an economist, I've been watching Argentina in amazement because it's it's not an impoverished country by any means, and it's you know got huge natural wealth and uh, mm. and very smart people, um, well educated uh, class of people. But it has made such a political mess repeatedly, and this mm. could be yet another one. I don't want to say on the first day after the election of uh, this guy that he'll really govern the way he campaigned, because sometimes they become a lot more responsible. But it could be that he's <laughs> that he is what he says he is, in which case uh, Argentina is going to face some real troubles. I don't I, it, it's regrettable because I'm I'm a, a fan of the BRICS. I would like to see them work. Argentina is a new member of the BRICS group. Uh, whether this guy stays in or out of the bricks or gets kicked out of the bricks, everything remains to be seen. Uh, but I, uh, I only hope that this guy was making this as a persona, not as a real politics, because uh, his real politics, uh, if delivered this way, would be very very detrimental to Argentina. So it's both parties. It's not one party or another party. They said, no, no, we won. It's a unipolar world. Anyway, Soviet Union's finished. We don't have any commitments to keep. And so Bill Clinton started the NATO enlargement in the mid-1990s. And really smart people knew at the time, this is reckless. This is dangerous. It's a cheat, and it's also a provocation. And so that went on for a long time. By the way, when President Putin came to power in 1999, he was not anti-European. He was not anti-American. He expected 
cooperation, but he said, stop the NATO enlargement because, you know, we have interests and we don't want your military on our border. Then came 9-11. The neocons went into absolute preeminence. Cheney basically ran the security state of the United States from 2001 to 2008. He was a very dangerous person. Uh, he said if there's 1% risk of something, you have to treat it like it's a 100% chance. You know, if Saddam has 1% chance of, nuclear, of having nuclear weapons, you have to treat it like it's certainty. That's a little crazy, by the way, in decision analysis. You don't treat a 1% as 100%, but you do create a lot of wars if you do that. So all the wars started. And the NATO enlargement continued in 2004, seven more countries. The Baltic states, Romania, Bulgaria, Slovenia and Slovakia. And then in 2007, Putin said, no more. So George W. Bush in 2008 said, yes, more. Ukraine and Georgia. This was not prudent. Prudence, prudencia, is a Latin word meaning practical good judgment. And it comes from a Greek word called sophrosyne, which means wisdom. This is not wisdom. This is stupid. And that's what they announced in Bucharest 2008. And many European leaders said to me at the time, what is he doing? We're against this. But one thing, this is the continuing slide into this, and I'll just finish with uh, two quick points on this. In 2014, the U.S. helped overthrow the president of Ukraine, Viktor Yanukovych. We know it from many means. I know it because I happen to see things that I wish I hadn't seen. But the U.S. was part of this overthrow. Putin didn't like that either because Yanukovych was actually rather cleverly trying to balance two giants. On the one side, the West saying, you must do this and you must do that. On the other side, Russia saying, you must do this and must do that. And Yanukovych's position was, we're neutral. Thank you, we're neutral. That was rather intolerable to the United States. Neutrality doesn't work in the US mindset because you're either with us or you're against us. And so they helped to overthrow him in February 2014. That's when the war started. And between 2014 and 2021, there was fighting the whole time, but the US put in billions of dollars of weaponry. And the Ukrainians built fortifications along this line that we're seeing the front line. That didn't just start a few months ago. That was eight years of fortifying the eastern Ukraine with American finance and know-how and weaponry. So at the end of 2021, after Biden had come into office, Putin said, look, you crossed every red line, but our red line is NATO stops its enlargement. You stop trying to get military bases on our borders. You stop putting weapon systems that can hit us in a few minutes. And we discuss it. And the White House answer was, nothing to discuss. And we're certainly not going to talk about NATO enlargement. And then the war, the invasion came on February 24th, 2022. So if ever there was a series of missed opportunities over 30 years to avoid a conflict, this is it. And that's why I'm deeply unimpressed by an analysis that said this war started on February 24th, 2022 by an unprovoked attack by President Putin. It's just not true. It started because of a buildup of conflict over a 30-year period and lots of cheating, I'm afraid, by the United States side. And that 
brings us to our mess right now. So we are, we are Jeff, uh, where we are right now, and uh, obviously this angle is, uh, is something that is uh, fiercely opposed by uh, official capital views of, of, of the European Union and, uh, and Washington as well. But uh, the fact of life is that, that a set of very harsh economic sanctions uh, were imposed on the Russian Federation unilaterally by the United States and the European Union. And uh, as a, both economist and an intellectual, what's your take on these sanctions? And how effective Those are opposites, by the way, economist and intellectual. An intellectual. <laughs> well, Just try to make the point. Try, try to be both in, in answering this. But, uh, and, and why do you think that uh, majority of world nations uh, don't seem to have been ready to uh, support this uh, course of action, at least not so far. First on the sanctions, you know, the United States uses sanctions a lot. It's an interesting policy. They use it a lot because it's uh, without any direct budget outlay, and it can do a lot of damage. And it doesn't require any public debate. It doesn't require any congressional approval. The public doesn't even understand what it is, but who cares? It's not their business. This is purely the president by signing, uh, by signing a document. And the U.S. uses these unilateral sanctions. This is different from sanctions approved by the UN. That's a different matter because the Security Council can vote sanctions under the UN Charter. But this is the US using its sanctions. And they do it a lot. The one thing I would observe about this is they almost never work in geopolitical terms. And I've watched for years the use of sanctions by the US as a cheap easy policy fail time and again. One was the United States <laughs> in one of the most ridiculous foreign policy uh, moves you can imagine suddenly decided under Trump to declare that the president of Venezuela wasn't the president but the president that the United States said was the president. So the United States one day announced uh, Maduro is not president, Guaido is president. It's, it's, in English we would slang, we would say pretty ballsy, uh, that you just announce one day who the other country's president actually is. It's a strange kind of foreign policy. Anyway, they said, okay, since Maduro's not president, he can't have any access to foreign exchange reserves anymore. He can't uh, fix, uh, Venezuela won't be allowed to fix its uh, oil drilling and so forth. So by stroke of a pen, they put on these unilateral sanctions. It actually worked in one sense. It completely crushed the Venezuelan economy, which declined by more than 50% in GDP, ex extraordinary decline. What didn't work is Maduro's still there, of course. Not, and Guaido, by the way, was thrown out even by the opposition saying, no, no, he's not our president anymore. The whole thing was absurd. It was worse than a high school play, actually. Oh, you're not student council president? He is. Yeah, but he won the vote. No, it doesn't matter. But anyway, they did this, but it didn't work geopolitically. It didn't end Maduro's government. In fact, in a way, he said, look, all this economic crisis caused by the gringos in the north, which was pretty accurate description, <laughs> after all. It was uh, the United States that did this. So now, by the way, the White House sends its emissaries to Maduro. Would you pump more oil because we have to replace the Russian oil? So now they're trying to become buddies with Maduro again. But the point is, it didn't work. And no U.S. sanctions regime that I know of in recent years has come close to working. So that's a starting point. So as soon as the U.S. put on sanctions on Russia, I talked to a very senior official and I said, you know, this isn't going to work. It, it doesn't work. 
This time it was worse though, because not only did it not cripple the Russian economy, the boomerang effect, which didn't apply in Venezuela so much, because you could crush Venezuela without the whole world feeling it, applied in the case of Russia, which is it's led to tremendous global negative consequences. So it didn't stop Russia from exporting all over the world. And I'll come to your question, why? But it also hurt Europe a lot, because Europe's told, no, you can't, uh, you can't by the low-cost energy that your industry has built upon. So it, the, the effects were quite serious, and we haven't seen the last of those effects yet. But when the sanctions were imposed, it was the US and always the Anglo-Saxon world. So that's the US, Canada, UK, Australia, New Zealand. That's a block of the security system of the US. Then the EU, OK? Then Japan, Korea, and Singapore. That's basically it. That's roughly 20% or so of the world population, roughly speaking maybe a little bit less, actually. And most of the rest of the world said, mm, we don't want to get into this. We trade with Russia. We trade with Ukraine. We're not party to this conflict. We think this conflict should stop with negotiations. And so most of the world does not want this. Of course, a lot of the world's afraid of the US secondary sanctions. But the vast majority of the world doesn't agree with these sanctions and doesn't even agree with the idea that any country can just decide to impose these sanctions, which are illegal in international law, after all. There's no legal basis for one country to say, stop trading with all those other countries. You can't do that. But they're a little afraid, but they don't impose the sanctions. This is the basic reason why Russian economy has done fine during the past year, because China trades with Russia, India trades with Russia, all the Asian countries trade with Russia, the Latin American countries trade with Russia. Today, Chancellor Schultz has, has been in South America, and he's being told by the South American leaders, don't pull us into this. We're not going to send arms to Ukraine. They trade with Russia, but they also trade with Ukraine, by the way. They don't want to be in this proxy war. So that's the main reason. And they don't view it like the US thought automatically they would view it, that this is an unprovoked attack. I speak to world leaders all over the world, and they understand full well this is a confrontation of two superpowers, not one side launching a war. And they want both sides to back off. The job of the President of the United States to put on the brakes. Because this country is a war machine at the top. We don't see it. We don't know it exactly. Eisenhower told us about it with the military industrial complex. This country is a war machine. The main job of the President of the United States is to stop the war machine from making wars. And we are now in an escalation heading towards Armageddon, according to the, the president. That's not a spectator sport. That's his job to keep us away from Armageddon. And, and Professor Sachs, you said this is a war between the US and Russia. We've heard threat after threat or call after call for an end to the Nord Stream 2 pipeline from Assistant Secretary of State Victoria Nuland to Joe Biden himself. Senator Ron Johnson, in questioning Nuland, appeared to actually call for the sabotage of the pipeline. But I'm, I'm literally talking about rolling back the, the, the pipeline. And I, I loosely define that, but I mean taking action that will prevent it from ever becoming operational. And so. Who do you think is responsible for the worst act of industrial sabotage in recent memory and maybe in 
in long memory. And what would their motive be considering that the German economy was on the hook here? <laughs> you know, I've said I, I, I wasn't there, but uh, my guess is <laughs> just like I think Ukraine is shelling the Zaporozhye nuclear power plant, I think the United States blew up Nord Stream. And they told us, you know, Biden said it in February, said if Putin invades, Nord Stream is over. And then a reporter said, well, what do you mean, Mr. President? How are you going to do that? He said, we have, we have our ways. We have our ways. We, we will bring an end to it. But, do, but how, will you, how will you do that exactly since the project and control of the project is within Germany's control? We will, uh, I promise you, we'll be able to do it. Come on. I, who controls the airspace? Who monitors the airspace? Who has the means to do this? Who said we're going to do it? Who said afterwards? This is a tremendous opportunity, this new situation, a tremendous opportunity to permanently wean Europe from Russian gas. That would be Secretary of State Blinken. Who said, thank you, USA, tweeting a picture of the burst pipeline? That would be Radek Sikorsky, former foreign minister of Poland. I, and by the way, you know, I've, uh, <laughs> I've been in touch with reporters uh, in papers that say we don't know or even worse who say Russia did this and then I talked to very senior reporters and they say Jeff of course it's it's the US what do you think but it doesn't get into our news my guess is my guess is that we're going to hear from Europe's investigators in a week or so hmm very hard we don't know trail went cold very hard to tell we'll keep looking but uh, we don't know but uh, terrible blow terrible blow that would be consistent with the u.s doing it and the fact that things went a bit quiet after this rather than parliamentarians throughout europe demanding our core infrastructure was blown up tells me that they're told Keep it quiet, keep it quiet. We don't really want to know exactly what happened. So I can't prove this, but it sure does, to my mind, put all the suspicion on the US side. Warnings, motive, capability, subsequent behavior, strange statements. To my mind, it adds up. I don't think Russia would blow up its core infrastructure. That doesn't make sense. And anyone else that did it would, you know, with Poland or Denmark or anyone else, that would be NATO, that would be with the US. President Joe Biden has said, Professor Sachs, that there will be an investigation into what he has deemed an act of deliberate sabotage. He said he'll send divers down, which is interesting because he knows that divers can reach it. Um, but do, do you think that this investigation will be a whitewash like the kind we saw the Organization for the Prohibition of Chemical Weapons carry out where inspectors were actually censored and even attacked by OPCW leadership around the Duma Syria uh, chemical weapon attack allegations in April 2018. And what do you what do you make specifically of that allegation? Um, my colleague here, Aaron Mate, has done as much to expose the cover up as anyone. So it's a real issue of interest here. Well, on uh, this, uh, you know, the pipeline, the U.S. can't be the one investigating if the U.S. is uh, the most likely culprit. I mean, they, they can, but we're not going to uh, find uh, any credibility in, in what comes out of this. Uh, so I think the idea of uh, an independent and transparent investigation would, would be great, but I'm not holding my breath. Uh, so uh, the U.S. may say something. Again, I'm 67 years old. It took me a long time to grow up to know that almost everything we hear is not true. We are a security state. We have a secret state, which uh, runs uh, most of our foreign and military policy, of course, and we don't hear the real thing. So I'm not putting too much stock uh, in, uh, in what the US comes up with. I'm a little more curious about what the Europeans say. It's their infrastructure, after all. Uh, it's their economy, it's their uh, gas pipeline, 
And you would think that they might be interested in actually knowing. But what's also true is that if they do find out or they do know, which I presume they do, uh, they're not speaking also because, you know, the U.S. they think is their security umbrella. I think the U.S. is uh, the great provocation that threatens Europe uh, just about as much as anything right now. So I don't know if we'll ever find out the truth, but frankly, there are so many issues that we never find out the truth about because we never really look. And when you have a state based on secrecy and impunity and like in love story never having to say you're sorry the cia doesn't say oh we made a mistake so sorry let's have a careful review of what we've done we're not going to find out about syria we're not going to find out about uh, this not from the u.s at least on on syria and the chemical weapons i'm i listen to you guys i'm not enough of an expert or inside to know but what i do know as a very basic very basic point the U.S., of course, uh, really instigated the war in Syria in 2011. It was the plan, like a hundred times before, to overthrow Assad. President uh, Obama signed a, a, a presidential finding to task the CIA to work with Saudi Arabia and others to overthrow Assad. This was operation timber sycamore what is amazing to me about the whole thing is that there's almost not been any coverage review explanation of this we heard only this is a civil war that's what we heard again and again and then we hear even more extraordinarily putin intervened in syria look what the russians have done Putin intervened years after the U.S. took action to overthrow Russia's ally. But we can't get this story told. I think the New York Times covered Operation Sycamore one day, if I remember, something around 2016. Nothing beforehand, nothing after. And I, I knew a lot about this in those years at the time uh, because... I, I knew what was happening through uh, diplomatic channels and so forth. It was like reality here, weirdness of our mainstream media here, and a narrative that was completely devoid of facts for years. And newspapers that are, of course, absolutely counter-informative. Quick uh, question on Ukraine before we move on to other topics. What do you think guides the U.S. officials who are overseeing the current policy? I mean, we had someone like Lindsey Graham recently say that as long as the U.S. arms Ukraine, they will fight to the last person. Four months into this thing, I like the structural path we're on here. As long as we help Ukraine with the weapons they need and the economic support, they will fight to the last person. Do you think that's the prevailing mentality right now? And, and why are they so determined to sacrifice Ukraine in this war against Russia? And, and if I could piggyback on that question, Professor Sachs, since you mentioned the, the Cuban Missile Crisis and your understanding of it, uh, throughout the Cuban Missile Crisis, the Kennedy brothers, John F. Kennedy, Bobby Kennedy, were pushing back against the Joint Chiefs. Then later in Vietnam, Although LBJ was going along with the Joint Chiefs, he was listening to character figures like George Ball, Assistant Secretary of State, who was an opponent of the war. Uh, do you have any insight into the thinking of the Biden administration? And is there anyone there who is resisting this drive towards nuclear escalation? I think that the uh, core motivation of the U.S. goes back to the neocon approach to foreign policy, which basically uh, has been the approach of the United States for 30 years now. At the end of the Soviet Union, the neocons took power, they're still in power, and their view is the U.S. is the unipolar power, it's the sole superpower, and we're going to keep it that way. And under U.S. strategic doctrines right now, there are two threats. Uh, Russia is one and China is the other. 
And it's not an accident that we're in confrontations on two fronts right now. So when it comes to Russia, as Big Brzezinski pretty much spelled this out in his uh, very interesting book, uh, uh, The Global Chessboard, uh, Grand Chessboard, A Global Chessboard, 1997. Uh, where he said that uh, Ukraine is the geographical pivot of Eurasia. It's the key. Uh, if the United States is basically uh, in charge, uh, Russia ceases to be even a regional power, basically. It's uh, cut out from the Black Sea and the Eastern Mediterranean. Ukraine's a big prize if you're a neocon. Uh, if, you know, and a neocon is someone who views the world like the game of risk that you want to get all your pieces on the board and you want to take uh, all of your opponent's pieces off the board. And Ukraine is really strategic from their point of view. And this has been spelled out by Robert Kagan, for example. He's, they've written about this quite openly. Uh, and of course, uh, you know, th that family uh, is, has been part of this for the whole time because uh, Victoria Newland is the Under Secretary of State for Political Affairs in the United States right now. She's been through this, through all these administrations. And so I think that this is the core, that we're gonna expand NATO. They have the idea that the North Atlantic reaches to Georgia. Now that's an interesting idea. That was uh, George Bush's uh, geographical insight in 2008. Extraordinarily cynical, but if you look at a map, what's the game plan? The game plan is control the Black Sea. It is Ukraine, Romania, Bulgaria, Turkey, and Georgia, all surrounding Russia, where their naval fleet is. So that's what Brzezinski was outlining back in 1997. Now they thought they could kind of slip it in uh, without uh, you know, Russia being able to oppose it because they kept expanding NATO uh, step by step First, the three, uh, Hungary, Poland, Czech Republic, by the way, against the promise, the clear, unequivocal promise to Gorbachev that NATO would not expand to the East. And like so many other things, the US government said, oh, we never said that. Well, they're liars. Of course they said it. And there's a full documentary record, easily accessible on the web to understand what was said. So long and the short of it is that's been the game plan for 30 years. And it's had its ups and downs because there, Ukraine itself is internally divided between East and West. And so the presidents have gone back and forth, pro-Russia, anti-Russia. And when a pro-Russian president, Viktor Yanukovych, came in in 2010, after Bush had invited Ukraine into NATO, over the opposition, by the way, of European leaders, but this is a US-led alliance, Yanukovych guided neutrality through the Ukrainian parliament. That stabilized things for a little while until Yanukovych was overthrown. Overthrown by whom? Well, according to the US narrative, oh, the mass, masses on the streets. According to what I saw with my own eyes, we stirred a lot of the pot and paid for a lot of that overthrow. I don't know how much. Everything's a lie, everything's hidden. But the Russians say that was a coup that the US led. I can't tell you exactly the US role, but we, we heard Victoria Newland on the tape uh, describing the formation of the new government and uh, other choice words for our European allies. And uh, I know with my own eyes, by the way, about US involvement uh, in, in that, not my involvement. I saw it, I was, oh my God, that's pretty weird what's going down. And this is Russia's point, which is, okay, you broke it again. Now, because as soon as that, as Yanukovych went down, the new government said, we want NATO. And then the US started pouring in the weapons, billions of dollars during the Trump years. Then Biden came and I thought, my God, maybe we'll get some sanity. Of course, he doubled down three times in 2021. At the highest levels, we said Ukraine will be a member of NATO in the NATO annual meeting, in a State Department strategic document with Ukraine, and in a Defense Department strategic document. So we doubled down. That's when I called the White House at the end of the year, please take the off-ramp. 
but they don't want to take the off-ramp. Now we're close to Armageddon, we're told. There is an off-ramp. We better take the off-ramp. We better start talking rather than just escalating.